Hello. Sir, we are live now. Yeah. So, good afternoon and good morning to some of you. I am Dr. Armagam. I am the president of uh, Indian Association of Sports Medicine. So, I have a great pleasure in welcoming you all for this series of webinar. This is uh, day two of our uh, AIDA program. And um, uh, today, we really have a power packed session. We have a uh, Star Wars in the sports medicine across the globe. They are, they are holding a very top position in the sports medicine organization across the world. And um, I'll request Dr. Tyagarajan to just briefly go over the program today. Thank you, sir. We have a fantastic program lined up today. Uh, the first speaker would be Professor Willem van der Moe, and uh, he would be talking about ACL injury, and where are we today? Followed by Dr. Seyed Ramanathan mm -hmm. from Oman on his talk with uh, BDB graph for ACL reconstruction. And this would be followed by Dr. Chin, uh, Chan Kin Yuan of Malaysia on double tunnel reconstruction, followed by Dr. Philip Landru of UAE. He'd be talking about shoulder instability in athletes, uh, its current status, and followed by your talk, sir, about uh, ankle orthoscopy in athletes. So it's all in all five topics. Uh, each would be around uh, 20 minutes of time. And after each talk, we may have a few minutes for question and answers. The YouTube chat box can be used by the audience for putting in their questions. And the moderator would put the questions to the speakers. And that is about the program, sir. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tyagarajan. And once again, and thank all the extreme fac the extreme faculties for joining us uh, this webinar. And uh, I uh, thank uh, Asian Federation of Sports Medicine for giving me appreciation, and especially Malaysian uh, Association of Sports Medicine and the Malaysian Institute for helping us uh, organizing this uh, webinar. And a special thanks to Dr. Tyagarajan for his untiring efforts to uh, put up this program. And it's my uh, uh, privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Willem van der Merwe. He is the current international president of ISACOS, the biggest sports medicine orthopedic uh, orthoscopy association across the globe in, in the world. And he served as the president of South African Society of Orthoscopy, Knee Surgery, Orthopedic uh, Sports Medicine. He is a very famous uh, orthopedic surgeon in Cape Town, South Africa. He is a consultant, sports science orthopedic clinic, sports science institute of South Africa, New Land. More than anything is, is my good friend and a mentor, and he, he helped in developing our Center for Sports Science uh, at Sri Ramachandra University, and constantly giving his advice. And he is also a visiting professor of our university. Uh, Willem, uh, I take this opportunity to invite you to give a lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think so. That's worked uh, quite nicely. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, Indian Association of Sports Medicine to this uh, seminar. It's a little bit pity I'm not in India. I've had really had my a good time there visiting my good friend. And thank you again uh, to everybody, but especially to Dr. Burumagam. All right. Uh, so my name is Willem van I'm the current president of ISACOS. And my topic today will be ACL injury. Where are we today? I would just like to invite you again to uh, the ISACOS meeting. The next one will be in Cape Town in uh, November 27th and December 1st. And we are really planning something special with India and Asia Pacific to, to come to this, to this meeting. So I'm just gonna start off with making a few observations about ACL. I think that's the first thing when we think about ACL surgery, we must really think of ACL as a dislocation of the knee with many structures injured. I think the time is, uh, we cannot think of the ACL, somebody didn't go inside and cut the ACL. So we must be really think uh, about the whole knee. There's always osteochondral lesions, you know, and the, the typical one is posterolateral in the tibia and anterolateral uh, in the femoral condyle. The meniscuses are injured, other ligaments are injured. There are many injuries and we mustn't just look at the, at the ACL itself. The next observation I want to make is that this is still a, a really de devastating injury in our, in our sporting community. 
I always say to them, the knee will never be the same. You know, on the pictures on the on the side there, that's Peter Stefft toy. He injured his knee, he had revision surgery, he played three months after the surgery. It was really a tough time. But here's a Cinderella story. He, uh, he was the man of the match for the World Cup final in Japan, and he was now voted as the best rugby player in the world with a bad injury. So yes, they can happen and they can go back again. But we must remember that it takes a long time to recover. There's a high incidence of re-injury and the chronic uh, long-term changes in osteoarthritis are always there. We can uh, modulate it, but we cannot change it. And the next thing is about teaching. I think really the teaching is, uh, I'm a real bit worried in the world. I think these days it's really industry and company driven. I think it is technique driven. They are teaching and I understand young surgeons want to have a technique. They just want to know where to do things. But I think it's dangerous. I think you have to do the understanding. You have to do why you do something and why what you are doing. And basic research, I think, is still very, very important. So a lot of these webinars and a lot of company driven are technique driven. And we have to just be careful that we understand where it all plays, how it all works and where it all fits in. So I will try and uh, put something, try and uh, see if I can do something about that. All right, so ACL surgery. So the first question then in sports medicine is, uh, can, we, can we treat it non-operatively? Can we, do we always have to operate on ACL injuries? And this is from the uh, Cochrane Library. This is the only study, I think, that was a level one study. And they found no difference in the scores between the knee scores of two and five years. But if you really look deep into the study, you look at the, the non-operative group, 40% of them had surgery within the two years, either having ACL surgery or having meniscal injuries or further injuries. And at five years, half of them already had surgery. So I think this is not a very good study to say that uh, we can do that non-operatively. I think this is a very good study. I was supposed to be part of it, but I, I wasn't. The Panther is the, from Pittsburgh, the group from Pittsburgh with Dr. Fu, who is my mentor, uh, Paul Kumusal, there was a big field and they really looked at the treatment after anterior of uh, crusade ligament. So it was published in, uh, in the ISACOS as well as in the ESCA, as well as in the AOSSM journals. And this is the statements that they came up with. They came out with 12 statements and on the right hand side, you can see all the experts agreed. And they said they agreed that operative and non-operative treatments are both acceptable treatments options for ACL. And I, th and I, I think you've got to go and read this, but you have to look a little bit further into this. And they also said that in active patients wishing to return to straight plane activities, so perhaps running, cycling, swimming, non-operative treatment is an option. I think the things that uh, would, that will sway us more to operation if there's other injuries, if there's injuries to the meniscus or the ligament or cartilage, and you have to do something about it already. That MRI picture of the lateral meniscal root injury, so you have to repair the root. And if you have to do these things, then I think you also have to do ACL surgery at the same time. More and more of this is coming to the foreground now. So predisposing factors, and one that's really been uh, coming more to the foreground is the slope of the tibia. So we now say if it's more than 10, 11 degrees, and you can see there the, the five degree one in a non-cutting uh, sport athlete, perhaps you can try some uh, non-operative treatment, but if it's more than 13%, this ACL is probably gonna fail and you need to do surgery. So they also are quite active. They say in active patients wishing to return to jumping, cutting, pivoting sports, Operative treatment is the preferred option of, of, of treatment for them to go back into their sport. They go even further to say that uh, if you do not do surgery on these guys, you are placing them at risk to have further injury to their knee and to have further complications. So I think the, the, uh, the overall message is it's strong that uh, you have to do surgery, not just to get the guy back to sport, but also to make sure he doesn't injure his knee any further. And even in these patients that are doing straight line, if they still have signs of instability and in that it's better to do the surgery early than to wait for them to have an episode and, and treat their, uh, and, uh, and, and injure their meniscus. So I think it's important that we know that non-operative is there, but I think it's a little bit popularism. We know all our patients want that. 
but if we can understand, and that's a good article, where it plays in, who you can do it with, and have the right uh, indications for non-operative. So when we are going to operate on our knee, what about ACL repair? This is, uh, we've all seen these images. We've all seen, we are now repairing the ACL with a brace or not without a brace and pulling it back onto the femur. So in my practice, I think this has really no place. I have seen a lot of this. I know Martha Murray well that started this. I think this is still in the, in the research field and she has the, um, the bridge enhanced anti-crusade because the crusade doesn't really heal very well inside. So I think repair to me is not really, should not really be part of, our, our, of what we do. I think if you're gonna go in there and drill all those tunnels and do everything, it's better to, do, uh, to put a scaffold, to put some kind of graft in there. But so if you get asked about this, I don't think this has any, at the moment, any play in our orthopedic practice. All right, so where are we today? And these are the results. This is, I just wanna put this in there to understand. If you are doing a good ACL, if you are doing a good surgery, single bundle, double bundle, fixation devices, those things don't really matter. If you do a good, then we'll get back to that. This is what you can expect. These are the things that you just have to keep in your mind to see if I'm doing good surgery. So return to play. If I have an elite athlete and I do an ACL surgery and I do good surgery, the literature tells us that there's a 90% chance that this athlete will play again at the same level. The problem is, and this is a study done in football in, the, in, in Europe, after three years, only 55 of them are still playing at that elite level. But I think the return to play in elite athletes are high. So normal athletes, the ones that just we, we treat probably mostly in our clinic, 65% of them return to pre-injury, which I think is quite high. We know the, the reason for not, not returning is multifactorial. And 80% of them will return to some kind of sport. The time that it takes to return to sport, I think, is around about nine months, everybody talks. We know there's study now that shows that the ACL is still adapting two, two years down the line, but I think most of us now, if you pass all the criteria, will return at about nine months. So if you're letting your athlete returning in six months, just be, just be careful. I think I'll, you, you need to keep this in the back of your mind. So when they return, what is, what is acceptable re-injury? And it's low. I mean, this is in elite athletes, 6% of elite athletes will re-injure their, their, uh, their ACL. And in normal athletes, just overall, if you take everybody in there, only 7%. So I think in your own practice, you need to know that my, if, your, if your re-injury rate is over 10%, I think you have to be worried. You have to go and look at your technique. The real problem is on these young patients, the under 25 active patients, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but the re-injury rate is now going up to about 25%, which I think is, is unacceptable. Osteoarthritis is still high, and this is a 30%. You can tell your patient that he's 20 years time, he's got 30% chance of having osteoclinical significant osteoarthritis. All right, so to get these results, what do we have to do? What do we have to do to this? And it's not much we have to do. We have to do a really good anatomic ACL reconstruction. We have to get the tunnels right. That's not what fixation we use, doesn't matter. There's a new study from the Scandinavian registry that shows normal interference screws probably do better than all these, all these others, but the fixation is not important. I think you have to have an appropriate graft. No allografts, no artificial, just you have to be able to harvest a hamstring, a BTB, or a quote, that if you know what you're doing and you do them well and you have the tunnels right, that's more important. You need to do meniscal repairs. You have to repair meniscus. You have to know how to do an all inside, inside out repair. You all know about the ramp lesions and the posterior medial portal. You know, you must, if you do ACLs, you must be able to repair that ramp lesion. You must be able to repair a meniscal root tears because I think this is part of ACL tears. You have to do this as part of treating the ACL. And you have to be able to either repair or augment the collateral ligaments. So if you can do this well, this is all you need to do. Then you're going to get the results that I had to be, that I gave before. And that's it. That's, that's not too much. Or is it too much? This is actually really hard to get this right all the time. And we all know this. We all do surgery. And then we look at it afterwards and we cannot believe where we put the tunnels. So I think I just want you to think when you do this, Get a system that works for you. Don't change every week. If you get them in the right time or place and you 
do good rehab and you repair everything, those are the results that you can sort of tell your patients that's what they can expect if you treat the ACL today. What are the weaknesses in, this, uh, in these results? I think 7% failure rate, I think that's fine. I think we can all expect that and it's, it's all something that we can accept, but not for an athlete and especially not for an elite athlete. And that's Andy Williams, a good friend of mine. I think 90% of his, his patients are uh, professional athletes in, the, in, in sport in the UK and, and rugby players. And for a professional athlete to have a failure is absolutely no good. It's devastating. So if you have a 7% failure rate in elite athletes or people that are playing professional sport, your practice is not going to survive. You have to do something more. I think the next problem is 25% failure in the young and active athlete. And this is a disaster. One in four in that age group is failing. I don't think we can accept that. And I think 30% osteoarthritis at 20 years is too high too. So this is really the weakness that if you just do the ACL, so you have to learn to do a little bit more. So you have to identify the patient that's going to fail and you have to do more for them. If you just do what we talked about in the beginning and just do the ACLs, it's, you're going to have failure. You have to learn how to do revision surgery. I think some of them are going to fail and you have to know how to, those that fail, how to really give them good revision so that they can carry on. So we have to do more. And this is a good study from the group from Japan, and they looked at risk factors for residual pivot shift after anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. And really the conclusion was that hyperextension and a greater preoperative pivot shift, so that huge pivot shift. And we all know these are the patients we don't like in our clinic because we know that they're gonna, they're gonna give us problems. But these are, these are risk factors. And if they have that, you cannot just fall back on a normal ACL and repairing everything, you have to do more. So these are the ones that I look at that I need, that I think need more in my practice. Patients with hyperextension, patients that have explosive pivot shift tests, the professional athlete, the guy that cannot afford to have a, a, a re-injury, and in active and, and young people that are doing still sport, and in all my revisions, I think I have to do more. And what do we do? And I think this is the new buzzword now, is the lateral tenodesis. And I think this, I'm just gonna say a little bit about that. I really do osteotomies to, to change that slope. I don't do them in the, in the athlete, but because I think it's gonna change is the way he's gonna do his sport. So I do that in all revision cases. I will do something about the, about the slope. All right, the other weakness is the 30% osteoarthritis. How can, we, how can we make this better for our patient? And I think here yeah, the answer is preserve the meniscus. Preserve the meniscus at all costs. And sometimes you have to repair them and tell the patient, listen, there's a good chance that it's going to fail, but we have to do that. We have to probably, if you want to bring that 30% down, because sometimes the meniscus is completely destroyed. We have to learn how to do meniscal transplants. And I think that's going to come in the future. We have to correct the alignment. People that are really bad varus or valgus, and if they have ACL and they have damage in that compartment, I think they're going to, they're going to go to osteoarthritis and we have to correct the alignment. We have to stabilize the knee. So if the ACL is not stable, one of our surgery is not stable, you have to do it again to stop osteoarthritis in the long run, you have to have a stable knee. And really, and I think everybody who thinks about stopping osteoarthritis is working on the articular cartilage. It's not. You have to get the others right because once the articular cartilage is damaged, I think you're too far down the line. And watch out for all these techniques that think we can, we can regrow cartilage. First do the first three and then do something about the cartilage. All right, I'm just gonna say something about lateral tenodesis and it will be nice to uh, have a discussion of this afterwards. So this is a study from the group from the Fowler Kennedy uh, Sports Medicine Clinic in Ontario in, in Canada. And it's Alan Getgood. This, this is uh, also a study that Isakos has sponsored. Multi-center trial, some good guys in there and they really looked at how does, it, how does lateral tenodesis, how does it change the two-year outcome from the stability group? And it's a very good randomized clinical trial. So these are the patients that they enrolled in the trial. They really took the high-risk patients. They took patients that are 25 years or younger with an ACL deficient knee. And it also had to meet two of these, the next three criteria. It had to have a grade two pivot shift or greater. So a very unstable knee. These guys wanted to go back to sport 
or the general ligament laxity. So we know these are the high risk patients. These are the ones that we know is not going to do well. And these are the ones that they now randomized into some with lateral tenodesis and some without. So what are the results that they got? Now, I think this is really important to me. So when you do lateral tenodesis, you're not doing a better ACL. Your patients, there was no difference in range of motion or activity or clinical outcome. So patients that have lateral tenodesis or lateral anterolateral ligament uh, reconstruction don't have better knees. They don't play better sport. They don't have more stable knees. That's not, in my mind, that's not what the lateral tenodesis do. The lateral tenodesis is there to save the ACL, to protect the ACL and to bring down the re-rupture rate. And in doing that, yes, well, Yes, our patients will do better and our long-term results will be better. But just be careful not to say somebody, not to think that on doing a lateral tenodesis and your knee now will be stronger and you'll even play better afterwards. The reason for doing it is not to improve clinical outcome. So when they looked at the results, they had two kinds of failure. They had clinical failure and that's somebody that's ACL is still intact but still has a persistent asymmetric pivot shift. And then they had graft failure with the tears confirmed during surgery or MRI result. Okay, so their failure rate in the clinical failure, if they only do an ACL reconstruction, they had 40%. 40% of these guys failed clinically. They still had a pivot shift. And they brought that down to 25% if they added a uh, lateral tenodesis. Graft rupture, it was 11% is quite low. So they had 11% graft rupture, but they really brought it down to 4%. So I think the lateral tenodesis really saves the ACL, really helps us for the graft to heal. And I think in the high, in the high risk patient, I think this is something that's really changed the way that we look at ACLs. And I think you need to do one and you need to know how, how you do a lateral tenodesis. There's many different techniques and I don't think one is, there's, there's, there's some, some that are not, not so good, but I'm, uh, I'm just gonna take you through the ones for the one that I do. I do a, a simple uh, prestige, uh, procedure, I do it open. So I make a lateral incision on the lateral knee, halfway between the, the, the uh, fibular head and the lateral epicondyle, about a five centimeter incision. I get the ITB behind it. I then take a strip of about 10 millimeters of ITB. I leave it attached distally at Gertie's tubercle. We know, and then I free the whole graft after that. I then, my, my insertion point in the, in the femur, I think is important. I think everybody's talking about this and where the normal ALL runs and where this goes. So I think that's a little bit open for debate. My personal feelings is this is not a, this is not a normal ligament. This for me is like a belts and braces. This is there to protect the ACL. It gives another ACL on the outside of the knee and it stops the lateral femoral condyle from dislocating off the back of the tibia. So my position, if that's your, where the lateral collateral ligament attaches, lateral epicondyle, you have to go proximal to that in line with the femur. So you can feel that and if you go, if you go there or a little bit further there or a little bit up there, I think those are all okay. What happened? So, Paula, has the internet go down? Some connection, connectivity. Issue. Yes, sir. We, we can wait for a few seconds. I think okay. he should be back. We'll wait. Is coming through uh, another uh, name. So, 
whether it's uh, Dr. Filippi I, or... I, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. I think we had a power failure or something. My, uh, my main computer went down, so I'm on my, my, uh, just on my laptop. But really, that's, uh, yeah. Aru, that's, that's about, that was about the end of my, my talk. I, uh, okay. I, I just, I, I fixed the, the tenodesis with a, with a screw. You have to, when you drill through it, you have to watch out not to, to, to hurt the ACL. But I'm worried about putting uh, staples or something on the side of the knee. So uh, sorry about that, but uh, I'll have to do on my, on my laptop, but I'll be here for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Willem, for an excellent lecture and uh, overview of the ACL injury, which is the most common injury we face in our athletic population. And a lot of uh, questions uh, you are answered, which is um, um, uh, kind of um, how to... And we have some questions uh, for you. Yeah. And um, one favorite question for you. Uh, what's your view on the role of genetic in ACL tears? Uh, yeah, so as you know, our unit has done probably some, probably some of the most in genetics in ACL. And there's certainly a genetic predisposition. The problem with it is not really very useful because it's always, it's, it's a combination of so many factors. So I think it's something that we, what we look at, but it's, uh, it's not really, it's not practical in our in our daily work, and our, for now, I would rather look at the hyperextension and the explosive pivot shift. But certainly, it's something that we have to look for in the future. But it's not practical at the moment. Okay, right now, but th there are some evidence. There are some uh, uh, some genetic factors predisposed to the ACL tear. That's what the science says. Absolutely, absolutely, there are. There's, but they are they they all the way from from not healing very well they all the way from from not having good collagen i think what's more important is the shape of the distal femur i think a big lateral condyle and a small tibia i think is is important i think the slope of the tibia and those the, the overall alignment things like that i think is more practical but genetics i think in the future but at the moment not practical but yes for sure there's a genetic predisposition for sure okay Thank you. And uh, one more question is, uh, in athletes with a revision ACL reconstruction, can they be better as before, performance-wise? What do you advise them? Oh, definitely, I, I do not think they can be better. I think that's not, uh, I wouldn't say that. Can they, can they play at a high level again? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And these guys are athletes, we know them. So the guy that's the best player, the best rugby player in the world at the moment has got a revision ACL. And he's got his father's hamstrings. I used his father's hamstrings to put into his knee. And he played three months after the surgery. So yes, these things can be done. But uh, so it's not the end of, the, of, the, of, the, of your career if you have a, a revision AC, ACL surgery. The, the fly half that, that won the previous, our fly half that won the previous World Cup had two revision surgeries. So these guys, these top athletes can certainly go back to it. But they will definitely not be better. They were good anyway. I didn't make them better. I just gave them a chance to play again. But yes, they can. You can definitely go with the revision surgery. You can go to full high international athlete. Well, that's really reassuring, and I'm sure many of our uh, delegates uh, will get this message to uh, reassure their um, uh, athletes. And you have a graph choice for competitive athletes in contact sport. Does it change depending upon a specific sport, or which is the most common graph to use? Uh, yeah, I think this is changing a little bit different parts in the world. So, you know, in, in, in football players in, in, in the UK, they are bone patella bone. The same guys in rugby in Australia, a lot of uh, hamstring tendons. In the, in the US, in the football, there's a lot of uh, bone patella bone. I think it's who you get taught with. And if you really look at all the studies, there's, there's little scientific evidence to push us one way to the other. But I think for me, in my heart and my rugby players, I like using quad tendon. For me, I like to use a bone patella bone for, for revision. So I'll use quad tendons, but uh, I, use, I use hamstrings too. Sometimes in, the, in our sprinting athletes, do we, what should we use? Should we use hamstrings or should we use quads or should we use from the other knee? We have uh, Dwayne Fenikak, the, the, the famous athlete. They use the they use the allograph from America, but he has a bone bruise that keeps him back. So, yes, I think the 
the uh, the graft is, a, is is important, but it's not that important. So it's more important that you know how to take the graft, that you do the same thing every time and that you do it very well. I think that's more important. There are some studies to show one way or the other, but not if you look in the look on the on the wide field. I really don't think so. Yeah, so I take the message that you know you don't just stick to one particular graft. As a surgeon, you must be expertised in all the graft and uh, which graft goes to which patient or athlete or depends upon individual choice. You cannot make a generalized statement. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you so much again, uh, Willem, for joining us. And uh, I know it's a, a different time. In, uh, That's fine. It's in the morning. I'll <laughs> put my mic on, 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 on mute and I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks. Okay. Thank you so much for saying this. Okay, so we're going to our next um, uh, talk, uh, ACL Reconstruction uh, by Dr. Um, Seyed Ramanathan. So he's, again, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Seyed Ramanathan, whom I know for many years, uh, because he hails from the, uh, his hometown is close to mine, uh, he's from near Coimbatore, which is a famous city near the Chennai. And he's a senior consultant, orthopedics and sports medicine Muscat Oman is the current Secretary General, Asian Federation of Sports Medicine. And he, he was a past president of our own Indian Association of Sports Medicine. He is a visiting professor of Tamil Nadu, Dr. MJ Medical University. And also more than anything else, he is a big supporter of uh, our Indian uh, sports medicine. He strives hard to put India on the international map. And uh, thank you very much for Dr. Ramanathan for uh, joining this um, webinar. I request you to give the uh, your lecture. Uh, good afternoon, uh, moderator, my good friend, uh, Dr. Aramugam, and everybody. Uh, thank you for those uh, kind words. I hope you can all see the slides over there. Just want to make sure on that. And am, am I audible? Yeah, we can see you well and I uh, can hear you well. Looks excellent. Please go on. Right. Lovely. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank you, Dr. Armugam, for having invited me. And it's always a pleasure coming back to my own home place. And uh, at least virtually, not uh, literally over there. And I've been asked to speak on ACL reconstruction using the BTB graft. And I think we've heard quite a bit now from Dr. Willem, an excellent lecture. Uh, it's one of the common knee injuries, the ACL injury in, in Oman. Uh, we do see a lot of ACL injuries, but most of it or majority of it is uh, due to football or soccer injuries. Uh, ACL reconstruction is a common operation worldwide. And the primary goal of ACL reconstruction is to restore stability. And the aim is to prevent recurrent instability and meniscal injury. And we heard earlier also about the uh, role of meniscus, because once you get a meniscal injury, uh, there's a much higher incidence of osteoarthritis, uh, usually immediate or in the late stage. So it's very important that uh, you should preserve the meniscus. And one of the reasons you would want to go in early to do an ACL reconstruction is to prevent any further meniscal injury if the patient has not had the surgery. Just looking at some of the factors uh, that go along with the ACL injury, I just mentioned about the meniscal pathology. Uh, ACL injuries can occur with uh, other ligament injuries, either single or multiple. Uh, the MCL is a very commonly injured ligament along with the ACL. And fortunately, uh, most of the time that can be treated non-operatively. You need to know about the activity level of the patient, and I think this would go a long way in choosing uh, the type of surgery you would like to do for him or her. Uh, you need to assess the skeletal immaturity, uh, because in a skeletally immature patient, again, you'll have to choose the right graft. Uh, maybe BTB may not be the ideal graft in someone like that, because it will the bony, bony ends will be crossing across the epiphysis. Timing of surgery, a lot has been said about it. Uh, in my practice, I don't have any hard and fast rules uh, regarding the timing. Uh, I do it as soon as the knee quietens a bit. It could be a few days, it could be a couple of weeks. But definitely choice of graft is an important decision to ensure success. And I think this is a personal decision.
to be made by the patient and the surgeon's own preference and experience of what you know and what you're good at. You've got to take into consideration patient-specific factors like the activity level, uh, also the size of the patient, a huge patient or a, a petite female. But in the ACL market, I think uh, there is no ideal graft. And the options we have are autografts and allografts. I have obviously left out the uh, synthetic grafts, which really are not, not done well. Although there, there, are, there are a few uh, grafts coming into practice now, but still I think that's uh, definitely uh, way behind. Having chosen the graft, I think success or failure depends heavily on the surgical technique. And I think this is very, very important on the placement of the graft because that uh, would uh, be decided by your tunnel placement and fixation of the graft. So I think basically when you're talking about a primary ACL reconstruction, you're talking about uh, patellar tendon and hamstring tendons mainly. I would put quadriceps tendon grafts a uh, little distal third. Uh, I think this slide probably uh, sums up most of what I would like to say about uh, BTP graft in my lecture. Uh, it is uh, one of the gold standards along with uh, hamstrings. Uh, the tissue quality is similar to the native ACL. And what do I mean by that? The patellar tendon graft has bone on either side, just like the native ACL, which is attached to the bone above on the femur and on the tibial spine on the tibia. The hamstring has bone attachment on one side, but not on the other. So this tends to have a different type of tissue as compared to the bone tendon bone. And so I think you're approaching the uh, native ACL when you choose a BTB. Uh, in many studies, it's given excellent functional outcomes. The fixation options, more or less on the interference screw fixation, which I think is one of the best. And I think Dr. Willem also mentioned that. Uh, I think it gives you a really good fixation, especially when you have a bone on either end. It tends to give a better restoration of the Lachman pivot shift and instrumented laxity texting. It allows for unrestricted rehabilitation, no crutches. You can start knee bending as early as possible. And next one is probably a very important thing in the BTB graft. Uh, because of the bone ends on either side, uh, it allows for bone to bone healing, uh, which allows earlier fixation and early return to sports uh, with increased participation. And I know we're gonna have a nice talk by Dr. Chan after this on double bundle, but the shape of the BTP graft itself automatically produces uh, something like two bundles uh, with improved rotational stability. And I think many studies have shown that uh, BTP gives low recurrence rates and a very stable knee in the long term. Obviously there are disadvantages. Uh, first would be the early post-operative period, especially it can be quite stormy. Uh, donor site morbidity, like patellar fractures and patellar tendon rupture, but fortunately this is very rare. I think the most important disadvantage thrown against the BTB would be, would be this, the anterior knee pain. Uh, I will come back to this because I don't agree with what's uh, being said in the, most of the literature. Uh, along with a little uh, study that I did on my patients on the incidence of anterior knee pain. So just some technical things. Uh, I will uh, not uh, repeat things which are common to all uh, uh, ACL reconstruction, but as far as the incision is concerned, I tend to go a little bit medial to the center. Uh, this allows you easier access on the entry point on the tibia. And I think also this reduces the chances of damaging the infrapetular branch of the uh, uh, cephanous nerve, which can sometimes give rise to a patch of numbness on the anterolateral aspect of the tibia. And when I start harvesting the graft, I start with the flexed knee on the tibial tubercle side. Once I've taken that, I extend the knee fully. So you don't need to have a big incision, a small incision. You can push the patella down. Your assistant can push the patella down and you can uh, harvest the patella graft with a small incision, uh, not, very big, not, not, not much bigger than the one that we use for a hamstring. I routinely do a notch plasty. I think this does stiffen the knee. Uh, most important, once you've chosen the graft, as I said, placement of tunnels, because this decides the position of your graft. Uh, we aim for isometric, uh, but it's funny that uh, the actual uh, native ACL is really not isometric, but I think when you do the reconstruction, you're aiming for that. Uh, I generally go trans tibial, but if I feel the point on the femur is not to my satisfaction, then I would choose the anteromedial portal 
to get the femoral tunnel. I give tension in about 10 to 20 degrees of flexion, depending on the laxity or gentle laxity of uh, the ligaments of the patient. And for fixation, of course, the titanium uh, interference screw, which I think uh, does very well, uh, putting bone against bone. And I aim for aperture fixation on the femoral side, uh, as that would prevent certain other complications. Post-op, as I said, uh, the immediate uh, pain uh, needs to be managed well, I think, in BTB graft. And for this, because my patients usually stay overnight, uh, I tend to use an infusion of uh, tramadol uh, for 24 hours, which works very well. Because if you can break that pain uh, in, the in the beginning, in the first 24 hours, uh, it tends to ease off uh, the subsequent post-operative period. And I mobilize them fully weight-bearing with a knee immobilizer, which I use, which I, I advise the patient to use for about 10 days max. Start knee flexion in about two days once the uh, severe pain has settled down, using a combination of open and closed kinetic chain exercises. Running after four months if the quadriceps have developed well, and return to sports between six to nine months, depending on the level. Complications, uh, I think by and large, infection is not a very big uh, problem as far as uh, any anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction is concerned. But I was just reading this uh, meta-analysis in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2018, uh, where they went into the risk of infections after ACL uh, reconstruction by graft type. And it was interesting to see that uh, the bone tendon bone had a 77% less chance of uh, risk of in infection as compared to the hamstring and about 64% less than the allograft. Uh, that is uh, quite significant. And then the others, which are not so uh, prevalent, uh, but I think ACL failure is something which uh, all of us dread. And failure can present in different ways. Uh, it could be arthrofibrosis. Uh, there could be many reasons for this. Some people would say timing, but in my practice, I don't find that. Uh, I think uh, it has sometimes to do with the non-compliance of the patient in following the uh, uh, post-op regime or uh, not doing proper rehab. Extensive dysfunction, of course, again, uh, it's supposed to be more common uh, with the uh, uh, BTB graft. Uh, but I think to a large extent, I have overcome this by drilling it into the patient right from day one, that when he's doing his exercises, when he's starting to bend, he's got to make sure that his knee comes back fully straight. There should be no gap under his knee. And if even from day two, he's finding that he's got to keep a pillow under his heel and push the knee down. And I think this has definitely helped to reduce this extensor dysfunction, uh, virtually uh, nil at the moment. Arthritis, and I think uh, definitely uh, arthritis can occur late stage, uh, especially if uh, the meniscus has been damaged along with the uh, uh, ligament. But I think the most uh, dreaded uh, failure would be recurrent instability to the failure. So I think we've got to get it right in the first time because after revision reconstructions, athletes do not perform as well as those after a primary reconstruction. So the first time you've really got to get it right. And I think we heard Dr. Williams say that you add uh, more attention to a certain category of patients. The risk factors, incomplete rehab, this can contribute to arthrofibrosis and re-rupture of the ACL. Uh, placement of the graft, the placement of your tunnels, very important. Uh, shouldn't get it vertical on the femoral side, not too anterior on the tibial side. You've got to get the right tension. Certain biomechanical factors in sports activities, when the athlete returns to sports, can sometimes uh, cause uh, damage to the graft, and uh, they may need uh, correction programs uh, during this period. I mentioned about anterior knee pain, and uh, this is something which I've done uh, some personal work uh, because it's often said that uh, anterior knee pain is aggravated by the daily activities of uh, people, especially in the Gulf and Middle East, where uh, kneeling for prayers and uh, the squatting, kneeling, etc., is a, a way of life in their daily activities. And I practice in Oman where this is all true that uh, people kneel five times a day for prayers and even in uh, the social custom. Uh, squatting and kneeling are the norms, basically. So when I started uh, the first ACL reconstruction program in Oman, that was in 1990, uh, I started with the, I mean, before that I was using some synthetic graphs, which uh, we had some failures or terrible disasters, I would say. 
And then we came to 1990 with the BTB petal attendant graft. And around, I think, mid-90s, uh, 95, 96, we started to hear a lot of uh, noise about the anterior knee pain. And I think that was probably timed with the advent of the hamstring graft coming in. And there was probably a corporate uh, or a commercial uh, reason behind it because the hamstring obviously can sell more of these uh, fixation implants than what uh, just the one screw can do for the petal tendon graft. So I looked at my patients and I didn't seem to find uh, uh, anterior knee pain as uh, was a big problem. So I decided to review some of my patients and uh, I presented this paper at the Isakos Congress in Washington in 1999. And I think that Dr. Arumugam was there also. I don't know, Aru, if you remember, you were also present there uh, in the yes, meeting. Yeah, yeah very, well. very well. Very well. <laughs> and uh, I chose five years, 91 to 95, uh, with a minimum two year follow up. Uh, of the total 163 patients, 156 were available for review. We have a nationalized health service system at that time. I was the only one in the whole of Oman doing it, so I could get my patients back very easily. The average age was 24.1 years. Average duration of symptoms was 22.5 months because a lot of patients had an ACL rupture, but uh, they never could get uh, surgical treatment till then. As you can see, football is very popular in Oman. Nearly 95% of the patients who injured their knees uh, got it through soccer or football. All the others are way behind. And I think this has not changed very much. Probably now it's 90% soccer injuries and if I take the new sports injury clinic statistics. The indication for surgery was uh, clinical, uh, repeated episodes of giving way and a positive pivot shift test and during this time we never had an MRI so the indication was always uh, clinical which I think still holds good today. 89% uh, had a negative pivot shift test and uh, the Lysium functional scoring mean score of 90 which I thought was good. 72% uh, returned to active sports, pre-injury level. 23% chose not to continue sports. It was their own decision, although some of them could have. And 5% uh, were unable to play. And what was uh, most interesting and significant to me was uh, the incidence of anterior knee pain in this group of 156 patients. There were only six patients. 3.8% had anterior knee pain. And of this, 50%, it was mild. Whereas if you looked at the literature or what was coming out at that time, anything from 5% to 50% was being quoted. So I used to wonder what could be the reason. And uh, to me, I think uh, these are some of the reasons that uh, those uh, figures could be high. Uh, I think pre-existing pain, which if you have not uh, detected, uh, that could add on to your statistics. And especially if you're a soldier, whether in the army or police, uh, about 20% of them naturally have uh, petrolofemoral pain. Uh, Post-surgical pain, I think any surgery on the knee does give rise to a lot of pain. Right? And especially in the intense rehab that uh, goes with these ligament repairs, uh, rehabilitation pain could be part of it. Uh, this is a statement that uh, Professor Brian Cole from uh, Rush Medical Center in Chicago said, the incidence of anterior knee, knee, knee pain is not categor categorically higher in petal tendon grafts and can occur with any ACL surgery and surgery in general. And I think I would uh, agree fully with him. And it definitely uh, show, uh, was borne out in the review that uh, we did here in Oman. So uh, coming to my conclusion, I think the ideal graft for ACL reconstruction should reproduce the biomechanics of the native ACL, allow for stable fixation and early incorporation and minimize morbidity. And in my opinion, I think the BTB graft uh, definitely uh, will satisfy uh, most of these uh, criteria uh, because uh, strength wise, it is stronger and stiffer than the native ACL. It allows for rapid bone to bone healing with the bony ends of the graft. And I think this is uh, definitely one of its uh, high plus points. It allows for unrestricted rehabilitation. I don't use crutches. They can start knee bending very early. Gives rise to excellent function and a very stable knee. And I mentioned about the infection, uh, less post-op infection rates. And I think many uh, papers have uh, borne uh, testimony that uh, less revision surgery compared to hamstring grafts. I've just quoted one, which is the Norwegian cruciate ligament registry study, uh, where they looked into 12,600 patients uh, in their registry. 
and they found there was a significant difference. And I think BTB has definitely stood the test of time and it's a simple technique. What's the future? Are there any newer techniques? Well, I don't see any on the horizon. I think uh, we had the uh, uh, robotic assisted ACL surgery come and I think it's gone or at least it's fading away. Uh, is there a new graft? Maybe when the artificial graft comes, but uh, there's a lot of noise about the quadriceps tendon graft, but I don't think it can actually replace the uh, BTB or the hamstring. Definitely there is some scope for enhancement of, tendon, of the bone tunnel healing. Uh, this is probably again more for the soft tissue grafts like hamstring, uh, whereas in the uh, BTB you have bone, so you may not need this. But there I think uh, things like bone morphogenetic proteins, growth factors, or even stem cells uh, could enhance the healing. Uh, I think regenerative medicine in the form of tissue engineering is probably an answer to get uh, an artificial graft, but definitely it's not uh, in the near future. Uh, they've tried synthetic biologic, uh, but they lacked the mechanical strength. But I think there is scope in the hybrid variety that there may be an artificial graft. And if it does come, I think it would be a great boon because it would do away with all the morbidity associated with uh, graft harvesting. Uh, these are all the references that I have uh, used in preparing this paper, and I'm quite willing to share it with other people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramanathan, for an alien lecture on a most important topic. I still remember your presentation, which is almost 20 years ago in Washington. <laughs> At that time, I was just starting my uh, uh, career, and in fact, I was influenced by your uh, talk. I uh, and I stayed on with the BTV graft. I didn't uh, go well with the uh, hamstring, and I still my BTV graft is my first choice. And as uh, Willem also mentioned, you can't just stick to one graft. So I still other use other graft depending upon the indications. But you you clearly pointed out uh, important point on anterior knee pain, and as other uh, expert panel will agree, there is a kind of coming back of a BTV graft now. Now, uh, people, more and more people are talking about, especially um, competitive athletes, contact sports, BTP graft is the way to go. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, renewed interest on the BTP graft now, and definitely uh, your lecture will give uh, very clear indications and clear idea. And there are some questions already coming up. Uh, due to lack of time, we'll take a few. And uh, do you find a difference in transtibial uh, versus transportal in terms of outcomes for uh, BTP? Uh, yeah, difficult question to answer because I haven't actually done a study on that. But I think looking at the general uh, result of the patients, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, I would say probably 80% I would be doing transtibial in my practice. And uh, it, I think it's more my own satisfaction that I've got the right point. Uh, than uh, basically any other objective way, I would say. And uh, and finally, the result is what I'm looking at. But I can't answer that question because I haven't done a specific study on comparing the two. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as you may be aware, one of the big reasons for shift uh, towards the hamstring was uh, uh, there was a lot of um, literature on the top, trans TBL is not anatomical. You can't get tunnels on the anatomical place. So you have to go only transportal and doing the BTP graph with the transportal is difficult. So you do uh, hamstring. And uh, what's your uh, uh, comment on that, uh, Ramanathan? Is trans TBL yeah. is a uh, non-anatomical reconstruction? Uh, I, I mean, I, I won't agree with that, but I think by adjusting the flexion on the knee, you can adjust the uh, direction in which the graft is going to go onto the femur. So based on that, I think if I can be sure that I've got right to the back of the knee, uh, probably just about uh, uh, in front of the posterior edge of the femur, and if I can get a slant to go backwards uh, by adjusting the flexion on the knee, uh, I think you can get a nice uh, 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 proper isometric uh, point. Yeah. yeah. And, and do your choice of graph differ for male or female athlete? Uh, yeah. Should be given for the female athlete too? Yeah, I mean, initially, I, I more or less said hamstring for the female and uh, BTB for all the others. It was more or less of that. But then 
I think if you look at the literature, there's a lot of uh, thing again using hamstring uh, for uh, women. One of, one is of course, uh, you know, they have uh, quadriceps dominance uh, and uh, cruciate ligament dominance. So this quadriceps dominance means that uh, the hamstring is not as strong as the quadriceps. So on top of that, you go and take a hamstring graft. I think you're weakening that more, uh, which makes them more susceptible for uh, a re-rupture or a failure. That is number one. There are many petite females who have a very, very uh, thin hamstring tendon, uh, which again may not be uh, sufficient uh, to stand up to the stress of a normal ACL ligament. So if, uh, uh, unless the patient themselves asks for hamstring, I try and sell the BTB first to the, uh, even to the athlete uh, in the same, uh, the females basically. Yeah. Okay, and uh, one more question. Uh, your choice of uh, uh, graph for revision, post primary BTB ACL reconstruction would be? I mean, you know, at, at the moment, I, I, I'm, I'm in isolation over here. Everybody around me is doing hamstrings. So when they all fail, uh, I'm the best, best man because I do the BTB. So it's not a big issue. So I think BTB, but obviously if my BTB fails, uh, I have uh, gone for, say, unfortunately we don't have uh, the luxury of uh, having an allograft over here. So I would go for a hamstring quadruple. I think quadruple hamstring, that's what I would do. Yeah. But otherwise here, most of the other, I mean, uh, I don't want to say it, but I think more of the uh, fail, fail ones are from outside than from inside, yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think also now Dr. Philip Landru is joining us. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ramanathan for uh, again, the excellent discussion on the most hot topic uh, in the ACL reconstruction, the uh, BTB uh, graft. And uh, uh, we'll be, uh, and Dr. Philip Landru, uh, welcome you for our uh, webinar. Hi, Aru. Hi. Sorry for my the delay, sorry to be late. And I'm- You're right in time. And we're going to have Dr. Chan uh, lecture, then we'll have uh, your lecture. And already uh, Dr. Willem is there and uh, Ramanada just finished his lecture. Well, you can I missed I miss the I missed the presentation of my president. I'm so sad. <laughs> but I will look at that on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Well, so I take uh, this opportunity to introduce our good friend Dr. Chan. Uh, he is the current president of Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine and vice president of Asian Federation of Sports Medicine. Is also a medical committee member of Olympic Council of Malaysia and a medical advisor to the Malaysian Rugby and committee member of East Malaysia Sports Council. And uh, is currently a consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon in Glenagil Hospitals, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he specializes in orthopedic sports medicine and arthroscopy. And uh, it's our honor to have you with us, Dr. Chan. Uh, I request you to give a lecture uh, on your topic. Thank you, Aru. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to this uh, uh, program and uh, it's a very timely one in, uh, under the circumstances. Um, let me just launch my thing. Um, can you guys see it? Is it working? Yeah, we can see that well and I can hear you well. Great, okay. Um, and I'd uh, like also to thank uh, IASM again uh, for organizing this uh, joint venture with MASM to, to host this webinar, which is a very useful program for, to a lot of people in this part of the world. Right, my talk today is about a double bundle uh, ACL reconstruction. Uh, it's a bit controversial in some areas, uh, in some people, with, with some people, and in some countries, but I, I think. Uh, my own results, uh, although I have not looked at it uh, clinically, but it seems to me that anecdotally it's been uh, reasonably successful so far. So I'll tell you, uh, uh, present some of the information why I, I moved into uh, this double bundle ACLR uh, reconstruction for ACL tears. So ACL is a very common injury as uh, Dr. Ramanathan has mentioned, and uh, it's very common. And if you look at it anatomically, it has three separate subunits uh, in, in three separate bundles, the anteromedial, posterior lateral, and the intermediate bundle. And it's covered by a zone synovium. And the footprint itself is, is very large on the female side. 
a small on the, it's tibial side, but it's smaller uh, on the femur side. And the average length is about 31 to 35 centimeters long and is 31 millimeters square cross sectionally. Uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, uh, this uh, double bundles are actually present in a lot of animals. It's present in the cow, the sheep, the goats, pigs, dogs, and rabbits, and is, is also very visible in, in an embryo. Uh, these are some of the studies done by Dr. Uh, Professor Freddie Fu, who has shown a lot of this today. And in the adult, you can see that they do have separate distinct bundles, if you look at it, and they, they uh, attach at different angles to the femur from the tibial side. And from the, on the tibial attachment, you can see that they are very, very big on the tibial attachment. And it has two very big functional units. And the intermediate one is somewhere in between, which is a lot smaller and uh, it's not as strong as a, a distinct structure on its own. Uh, on the MRI, you can also uh, see these ligaments quite distinctly if it's done in the correct plane when you uh, do your uh, sections on the MRI scans. And you can see clearly the anterior medial bundle and the posterior lateral bundles. Biomechanically, uh, the uh, ACL itself uh, has a, a different uh, failure loads at different ages. And it also has, uh, it will fail at different flexion position of the knee and also the rate of the force has been applied. And uh, the average uh, ultimate tensile load is about 1,700, but in the younger patient, it'll be about 2,160 uh, uh, newtons uh, below as shown here. And uh, it's not a, a very, very stiff structure, but it's also reasonably strong in, and it is able to absorb a lot of energy before it fails. Uh, and looking at the graft, uh, the table of some uh, 10 loading tests on tensile strength of the grafts, the intact ACL is about 2,160 and the allografts are generally uh, a lot weaker than the original native ACL. Uh, and a quadruple tendon hamstring autograph, it's, it's a lot more uh, in terms of strength compared to the native ACL, but these are all tested at time zero. So we really don't know what happens when all these graphs mature over time. And uh, the quadriceps is also quite a reasonable, uh, has a, quite a reasonable tensile strength, uh, nearly matching the uh, native uh, ACL. Uh, and the, the, the job of the ACL is to act like a primary restraint, particularly to the anterior tibial displacement, especially at the 90 degrees uh, flexion of the knee. And the AM and PL function slightly differently. And in flexion, it is tight. The AM is tight. And in extension, the posterior lateral is tight. And this prevents hyperextension of the knee and also allows the knee to rotate uh, when it's flexed. The ACL tension uh, is, is uh, least at about 40 degrees flexion, and it also is a sec secondary restraint to tibial rotation. And then quite importantly, also the proprioceptive function of a normal ACL, that is something that is uh, perhaps uh, not mentioned a lot in a lot of the literature. So this is a, a, a video of, of uh, uh, how the ACL functions and moves. As you can see, the AM is on the front here and the PL is at back. As you rotate, it actually changes position on the femoral side. And in doing so, the, uh, the tension changes and allows for a rotation of particularly the PL, when, which is its lax at 90 degrees. And this allows your knee to rotate and accommodate for movement and roll back around the knee. So some basic tests, uh, uh, biomechanical studies have shown that the forces uh, in the uh, anteromedial bundle itself do not change uh, a lot. It's reasonably constant throughout the range of motion. Uh, and the, uh, the PL, however, changes quite a bit. Uh, in flexion, uh, it is relatively, uh, 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 the tension in the force is uh, particularly high in the extension, but as you flex, it actually drops down, okay? Uh, and if you look at 
this, this flexion range as well. Again, you can see at 15 and 30 degrees, the, uh, the forces in the uh, AM bundle is pretty much constant. It doesn't change very much. And on this, this graph here, it's a bit complicated, but just look at the bottom one. Uh, the, this graph shows that you know the ACL strain, <clears throat> the change in the length is also uh, depicted by these two graphs, which also confirms that, uh, what we mentioned earlier about the force, that the, the force of the AM bundle is pretty much constant throughout, tight at the full end of extension, relative flat, and then at the end of the uh, maximal flexion, it goes up again, while the PL actually changes, all right? from uh, full extension to uh, being very tight and full extension and, and, and uh, uh, not lax at all. And at the 120 degrees, when it becomes very lax and it allows for the uh, tibia to rotate on the femur. And the more recent studies uh, done by the Japanese uh, using triple bundles and double bundles and single bundles in the biomechanical test shows that uh, uh, the laxity of, of the graphs when they put in using a single tunnel, a single bundle or a double bundle as compared to a triple bundle, it shows that the triple bundle is uh, better at pre uh, preventing any laxity of the knee post uh, reconstruction. But uh, uh, the techniques are a little bit complicated with drilling three separate holes or three tunnels, which can be, I guess, pretty technically difficult. And uh, looking at tibial translation, uh, it matches, if you look at this graph here on the top, it's, if you see the ACL uh, with a single reconstruction, uh, you can see this triangular uh, uh, graph. It actually shows that uh, it's slightly higher than the native intact ACL, the way it, uh, in terms of translation. So the one that with the anatomical reconstruction keeps it best closest to the na native uh, Tibial translation when it moves through the different range of angles of uh, the knee. Okay. And kinematic wise, uh, again, it also matches more of the uh, native uh, ACL when uh, double bundle is reconstructed in knees that are ACL deficient. And um, it's also more recently, the uh, anatomical rollback is also an, a thing that is probably quite important uh, in this part of the world, but particularly where there's a lot of people who uh, kneel and squat. Uh, so it, it shows that the, the double bundle allows a more normal femoral rollback, which is important for squatting and kneeling uh, culturally, which is uh, a, a common thing here. And is measured based on the, the distance uh, differences in the, uh, the markers here and plotting it on a graph. And you can see the correlation is that, you know, there is actually a good correlation between the uh, double bundles producing a better uh, ability to restore your femoral rollback. And um, if you look at it at the uh, using 3D uh, registration techniques of this double bundle uh, ACL reconstructions, it shows again that the AP instability uh, is, is much better, but also the rotation wise, it's, it's a lot better in the squatting position. And again, these have uh, important uh, implications for cultural uh, parts of the world, you know, this, this side, uh, where there are lots of people who need to squat and kneel and a lot of this sort of function in their daily lives. And um, some of the papers also published by uh, Professor Fu's group show that, uh, you know, uh, the cartilage actually may uh, act regenerate to some extent when it's uh, double bundle, uh, it's, it's uh, reconstructed as it provides a better environment for the cartilage to, uh, to heal and, and also uh, perhaps hopefully reduce the arthritic changes as well. So uh, the, the common mechanism for, for failure is like shown in this picture, especially in women, uh, where they have a valgus uh, angle on landing and internally rotating the femur. And, and you can see that this is how they rupture the ACL. And this is another one, our, our footballer, Michael, Michael Owen. You can see he, damages, uh, he damaged his knee in a similar fashion. Uh, and 
pivoting on the uh, right knee and you can see in the valgus and inter rotating and there he goes and damages the uh, ACL. So the, the ACL is, is all important, not just only in the AP translation, but also to protect uh, rotation to some extent. Uh, and if the ACL is missing, the, the point of rotation now actually is uh, more medialized to the medial edge of the knee. And as a result, the whole uh, lateral tibial condyle actually translates more significantly as is shown here in this pivot shift test. And this is the reason why the pivot shift test is positive with when there's a uh, ACL uh, deficiency uh, occurs. And in the AP direction, uh, you can see again, without the ACL, the AP translation is, is quite significant. So the normal way of doing this sort of surgery is, is, is to uh, using separate portals and an incision here to harvest the hamstrings uh, and a separate portal to, to target your AM pot, uh, portal on the uh, tunnels on the femur side. Uh, the, I think Professor Fu uses this sort of technique, but I, I generally put the patient's knee on the table and just do it as if it was for a total knee replacement. Uh, and this is a arthroscopic image of uh, the knee, the inside of a knee with the native ACL. Uh, this is the ACL and this is PCL and the PL bundle is just uh, visible just, just behind the AM bundle here. And this is what happens when, when someone has a ruptured ACL, the, the AM bundles and parts of the AM and PL are all very lax. And you can see once this is the PCL on the other side of this uh, torn ligament and the stump on the front here can actually block a full extension. And this is one reason why a lot of people uh, can have a locked knee, uh, locked in full extension or lack of, not locked, I mean, they have lack of full extension and have difficulty in, in, in uh, moving the knees in a normal way. Uh, and these are arthroscopic images showing the two tunnels on the femur side uh, and on the tibial side. But if, if it, a single tunnel is reconstructed, the average point of between the two, two uh, center points of the AM and PL bundle is chosen as the, uh, uh, the, the ideal position to, to uh, construct a single bundle. And on the tibial side, again, uh, you use targeting jigs to aim for these tunnels. And you can see these wires, uh, guide wires that is used to uh, uh, assist in targeting the area where the tunnels will exit and where the graph will come through and pulling the graphs, which has been uh, attached to these buttons made of titanium. Uh, they will allow this to be fixed inside the femoral tunnel. And this will be the tibial end, which will be fixed with the bioabsorbable screws. So these are uh, the, some of the clinical pictures that you can see, and it recreates that uh, Howell's angle has just been described uh, when the ACL is done anatomically with a double bundle and the AM and the PL. Uh, and you can feel for the different tension as you cycle the knee uh, before fixation by pulling it uh, on the graft, maintaining tension, you can actually feel how it moves and how it translates, okay? And you can confirm that by using x-rays to, to target your, where you target your, your uh, tibial tunnels with these guide wires. And this is a post-operative image showing all the different tunnels with all the and the buttons and a bioabsorbable screws, which is less visible here on the tibia. And uh, on the MRI, again, you can see very distinct bundles that's been recreated, which nearly mimics the uh, normal native ACL uh, position of the, uh, uh, the, the ligament itself. And uh, these are just CT scan images showing uh, incorrect placement of the tunnel. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is really two anterior in front of the lateral intercondylar ridge, which will inevitably cause the graft to fail. And this is more of an anatomical position on the femur side, which is the correct anatomical position. And on the tibial side, again, it almost mimics what the native ACL should be. And over time with the correct placement, there will be ligamentiz ligamentization of the tendon. And this hopefully will provide uh, remodeling abilities for the graft to mature and uh, become a normal graft. Uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, follow-up of a four to 11 year follow-up, more recently published, 
2019 by the Italian group. Uh, you can see that uh, the, um, uh, it shows clinical results that just over the long term shows a low failure rate and high percentage of return to sports to the pre-injury level in, in this group of patients. So it clinically, it, it, it does seem to provide good, good results. Uh, and, um, and also there were fewer re-ruptures with less anterior posterior rotatory uh, laxity uh, and uh, an older report shows that the, in, in terms of the Lachman pivot shift and uh, anterior draw test, uh, the double bundle is a little bit more stable in terms of all these tests. And the outcome scores again is, is quite reasonable. And uh, look at the registry, the Swedish registry, long-term survival of a single bundle uh, is, is a lot, uh, this, this graph here at the bottom, uh, this line, it shows that you know, the survival, survival rate at about the eight year mark is uh, falling off quite quickly, right? Compared to the single bundle. And this is just a hodgepodge of all the various techniques, but essentially this is just comparing this the single tunnel and the double bundle. Uh, and the hope is that there will be a low rate of arthritic progression and some of the uh, papers have suggested that's the case, but uh, we're not too clear yet. It's still perhaps too early to, to, to be absolutely sure. So in, in summary, um, the ACL is an uh, important uh, ligament for stability and in rotation and translation. Uh, the normal kinematics and the force distribution seems to be better in the double bundle, uh, certainly in the biomechanical studies. Uh, and with that, we, we hope to produce a uh, better results in terms of osteoarthritic changes being much less. Uh, however, it's a very demanding technique. There are areas of uh, complications and, and, uh, and uh, uh, problems associated with this technique and uh, needs, people need to be aware of it. And it can be costly because you're essentially doubling up all your implants, implant costs. And of course, case selection is very important as uh, Dr. Ramanathan has uh, suggested. For athletes, uh, a more predictable way of healing perhaps would be with the BTD graph, uh, but uh, for uh, more uh, non-top flight athletes, perhaps a BTB double bundle may be a good option. So uh, that's my presentation. Uh, I hope it was uh, quite useful um, for uh, the participants uh, listening to this uh, webinar. And if I may, uh, Chairman, uh, Dr. Amurugam, uh, can I present a, a few words about uh, MASM? Yes, yes, uh, Dr. Chan, thanks for the excellent lecture. Please uh, go on on the uh, MASM. Okay, right. I'd uh, just like to, to mention a few words about uh, Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine. We are an association that's been formed in Malaysia uh, for quite some time now. Uh, by a group of, of uh, enthusiastic uh, doctors and physicians uh, to promote and educate sports medicine and exercise science in Malaysia. Uh, it was established as far back as in 1973 and was one of the uh, founding members of AFSM. Uh, and it is also the only sports medicine body recognized by the uh, Olympic Council of Malaysia. And also it's a non-profit organization uh, and uh, which involves a lot of sports uh, medicine practitioners, uh, sports and exercise science practitioners, and also allied health practitioners. Uh, we are at the international level associated with the FIMS, Federation of Inter International of Sports Medicine, and regionally with the Asian Federation of Sports Medicine, uh, where I'm a vice president in that organization, taking care of the ASEAN group, and that's where I met uh, Dr. Aru and Tiago Rajan in one of our meetings. Uh, and um, with this, we work with a whole group of uh, people here. And the aim is to uh, raise the standard of care for all Malaysians and in particular the athletes. And we empower them as uh, athletes and individuals to, uh, uh, to, to uh, maximize their potential through uh, appropriate medical and scientific knowledge. And we hope that uh, we will be able to continue to do that. And we will do that through various activities like uh, clinical and scientific conferences, workshops and seminars. Uh, and we've, uh, in that respect, have organized the first and the second ASEAN Sports Medicine Conference in Kuala Lumpur, which has been very successful. 
uh, and we hope that uh, the ASEAN countries will take turns to rotate around, around different countries uh, to, to continue this tradition. Uh, and uh, we've also organized the functional ACL rehab workshops and uh, medical coverage workshops. And uh, we have lectures and the sports medicine series workshops on ankles, dry needling, and also for the community and coaches, uh, basic life support courses as well. Uh, we also work with the Ministry of Health. And we've met up with uh, our Director General of Health and we try to uh, give our input uh, in health and sports policy and programs and try to shape things uh, and hoping that uh, we will be able to influence and have a positive outcome for the country. So we look forward uh, to continue our collaboration, especially with IASM and other organizations in the region uh, and in partnership and also stakeholders and government agencies and sport industries. And we would uh, hope to continue working together in a strategic partnership that's transparent in a professional manner. And before I sign off, just like to invite all of you, uh, especially the uh, visitors to the uh, YouTube program uh, channel uh, to, to attend the International Sports Medicine and Exercise Science Conference in 2020 in Kuala Lumpur. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan uh, for your uh... Uh, presentation and as well as uh, knowing about your uh, vision for uh, Asian uh, uh, sports uh, organization and with uh, Isakos president also on the board, I'm sure we can uh, establish a good um, collaboration and promote uh, sports science and this part of the world. Uh, so now going back to lecture, uh, we'll have some uh, questions and um, and one question, like, uh, like all your ACL reconstruction, you do a double bundle ACL reconstruction, Dr. Chan, or how do you choose them? Uh, no, uh, it depends on the uh, the patient and or the athlete. Um, for for high demand athlete, then the VTB would probably be, be a better option. But I would discuss with the patient themselves uh, whether they would prefer one or the other. Um, but a majority of my practice will be mainly double bundle. Okay. And um, does the size of femoral condyle in the Asian population worry you when selecting this technique? Because, you know, we, we have generally smaller knee. So Yes, correct. Yeah, that's very, very true. Uh, not just the femoral condyle, even the tibial surface as well. Um, uh, of course, uh, that's one of the reasons why they, they, these patients need to be selected carefully. Uh, most times we get away with it. Uh, we are able to uh, uh, drill two femoral tunnels uh, without crashing. Um, and um, so far we've gotten away with it without much major in incidents. Uh, but there are cases where the patients are very, very small, especially girls in, in this part of the world where they are very, very small. And in, in some cases, this is not possible. And these patients are told well in advance that if the uh, an anatomy or the graph size don't uh, fulfill the appropriate criteria, then it may not be possible to do a double tunnel. And then we will, in which case, revert to the uh, uh, single bundle. Okay, thank you. And uh, we chose, you know, if you see to today's uh, uh, webinar, more on ACL because of the most common injury. And we have experts on this on the panel. Dr. Philip Landro also is does uh, uh, fairly knee and shoulder, and uh, I'll probably one comment uh, from all of them, uh, including Dr. Willem and Dr. Ramanathan. You know, practice. Uh, how do you see the uh, pull, the uh, double bundle reconstruction or single bundle with the PTB or hamstring? And at one point of time, there was a big uh, push towards double bundle ACL reconstruction, and uh, now we are now kind of it's not so popular. So I like to have comment from. Um, each one of you, maybe Dr. Flippy to go first. Uh, and Anuja. Yeah, I'm the first? Yes. Okay, thank you, Aru, for the question. Um, maybe I would answer in the question. Thank you, uh, Chan, for this uh, excellent presentation. It's uh, really a, a nice overview on the double bundle reconstruction. Um, I'm not using uh, any more uh, double bundle because I didn't see any difference in terms of, uh, of uh, result. 
Uh, I believe that maybe uh, the reason why the, the results are be better with double bundle, because I believe that people who are doing double bundle are more experimented surgeons. So maybe there is a bias in this, in this way to uh, explain that the double bundle reconstruction maybe are better because they are done by an experimented surgeon. But I have a question because I'm much more uh, uh, single bundle and lateral tenodesis in case. When there is a rotational laxity, uh, do you do? Do you trust only the double bundle reconstruction to correct the rotational laxity? So it means you believe that it's only due to the rupture of the SEL, or do you believe still that there is a, a possibility of, uh, in some case, of uh, lesion of the anterior lateral complex, and then do you add the lateral tenodesis or ALL reconstruction, whatever the technique? Right. Um, so, so far, I've not done any uh, lateral tenodesis at the present moment, but I'm looking into that at the present moment. But the reason for this group, especially those who are female with very lax joints, those are the really high risk groups. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, um, I have a few failures, but they're not completely torn, but they're a bit loose, but so far they manage. So I've not, not needed to revise them just yet, but I, I agree. And the other point is also the tibial slope, which perhaps is something that we have not looked into yep. early enough, which is another area that we need to be very, very careful about uh, in, in selecting this group of patients. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, Dr. Ramanathan, you have a comment on double bundle ACL reconstruction? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I did a few very early on. Uh, I must say, I found it technically a bit difficult. And another thing that scared me was uh, what would I do if it didn't, if it failed, you know, uh, with uh, two of those things coming together. So you obviously couldn't go back for a double bundle revision. And uh, if you were to use, say, a petal tendon or something, uh, how would I uh, be able to do that? So that also scared me. And then I came back to uh, my petal tendon. Like even when the single hamstrings came along, I was in it for about two or three years. And then uh, I came back again to petal tendon. So it was always coming back home uh, to what uh, I'm more familiar with and uh, uh, more experienced with. But yeah, I had a very short this thing with uh, double, double bundle from Germany. I had learned over there. And then uh, I came back quickly to PTB. Yeah. Finally, That's... comment from Dr. Willem, the president of Isakos. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so I'm a big fan of double bundle. I did a lot of them. I worked with Dr. Fu. We have really looked at it. I think the, the models in the, it, it, it mimics the normal ACL definitely better. I now do less of them. So for me, I think there's, there's a couple of points. Firstly, I think in the, recon, uh, the revision, uh, that's not a problem. We have to just be careful not to make two 10 tunnels. So I think you have to be more careful about smaller tunnels. And my friend uh, from Japan, um, they, they, they do, and small people, you can still do double bundle. I don't think that's a problem. And I think the main reason is that the double bundle is more, takes more load more earlier in the full range of motion. So I think in really, uh, in South Africa, we have a lot of biokineticians and people are really stressing the knee early. And I think if you stress a double bundle, they feel so good. I think there was a little bit more early, early failure. It's not, not easy to say. But I think it's because they, they, they are really loaded in the whole range of motion. I've now looked at my long-term results, and I do think that they are better. So I think in future, I'll be probably doing some more double bundle again. A little bit technical, more different, but I don't think that's a problem. But I do agree with uh, Philip is that I, I do not think a, if you have a at-risk patient, I don't think a double bundle is going to get you away from your, your at-risk patient. And I think the lateral tenodesis, I will still do even with a double bundle. And again, as I said, the tenodesis is there to save the, the, uh, the ACL. And I think perhaps in a double bundle, it will be really, really good because we can now load them earlier. But so in summary, I do think that biomechanically, I think double bundle is better. And I think it's a really good technique. But I think if you are not, uh, if you are familiar with one and you have good results, Perhaps stay with your old results because the differences are, are small and more in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willem. That sums it up all. It's a very hot debate uh, topic. And in fact, you can discuss uh, on this for the, on the whole day. But uh, since lack of time and also we are moving on to different region in the body. Uh, so we'll go into the next talk. 
and it is my pleasure and honor to invite my good friend dr flip landru uh, he is currently a member on the board of directors of visakos in addition uh, he is um, an editor in position in the field of sports dermatology including director of book collection editor in chief and member of the scientific committee of several publication and uh, is head of orthopedic surgeon consultant orthopedic surgeon at um, uh, dubai previously he was a chief of surgery at aspetar qatar where i visited him and i know him since then and he has collaborated with our center for sport science and he has helped us in shaping our center to reach the uh, the position of what we are now and previously he was working in paris france where combined private and public surgical activity he was a reference surgeon for numerous regional and national uh, sports team including state franco's rugby team french national judo team french national handball uh, women team and now uh, national football team of qatar and dr landru and i request you to give a talk on the shoulder instability thank you very much uh, aru and uh, <clears throat> i would say that uh, you are uh, more than a colleague you are a friend because we have a long uh, long friendship uh, now and uh, i would like to thank uh, the opportunity and uh, the, your invitation it's an honor for me not for you to to be part of this uh, great uh, webinar with uh, this initiative of uh, collaboration with different organization and uh, i'm very impressed and uh, congratulations for that so my task uh, is to uh, I will share my screen. My task is to uh, talk about the shoulder instability in athletic population. <clears throat> I hope you can see my uh, my uh, screen now. And uh, is it okay? You can put on the uh, presentation mode. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Professor Rugan asked me to focus the topic on the uh, anterior shoulder instability because. This is uh, uh, obviously a large uh, topic and it's uh, enough to discuss. So we will focus this discussion on anterior traumatic, traumatic anterior shoulder instability in athletic population and to try to tell what is the current status. And I will give you my opinion based on the, my experience in, the, in this field. Uh, when we talk about the shoulder instability in uh, athletic population, I believe that these are the three main questions. The first one is about epidemiology and risk of recurrence. In other words, uh, is it more frequent? Is there a difference of epidemiology and risk of recurrence? And then the two other questions, which are a bit related to the first one, uh, are about the treatment. So do we have to manage differently the first episode of dislocation? And is the treatment of a, a chronic uh, case is different than uh, the normal, I would say, non-athletic population? So first of all, what the literature said now in 2021, uh, about uh, in 2020-21, I would say about the epidemiology of uh, traumatic anterior shoulder instability in the athletic population. You know that in the general population, it represents 1.7% of uh, general population in shoulder instability. And it's clear that we have different uh, paper well known about the epidemiology now. And for example, Owens and I uh, study uh, military students, which are the, for the majority of the people of the group uh, sport. They said that 2.8% uh, experienced new traumatic shoulder instability event during nine months, and 11 experienced multiple events. But actually, it's better to compare with the general population to have a better idea. We can say that uh, based on literature currently, the men are 2.5 times more unstable than the women. The contact sport with uh, other athletes during competition are the most uh, risk for a shoulder dislocation. And Owen show, for example, that the dislocation rate among athletes is uh, higher, definitely higher than the general population. And if you look at the risk of recurrence, not only the first episode, but the recurrence, the age and the gender show that the young men are, are, are at high risk. And this study showing, uh, you know, there are multiple studies with this statistic, but this one is very nice because it showed that 75% of the male athletes under 25 years old will develop recurrent instability by two years, rising to 85% at five years. So if we uh, look at other people, the youth is also a marker of uh, early return uh, uh, risk factor with the early return to competitive sport, non-compliance, risk rehabilitation, 
and more significant capsular abduction. Of course, it's multifactorial. It's not only the age and the sport activity. For example, the ligament laxity and the participation in high level sport was shown to be a higher risk of uh, recurrence. So if we uh, have to get a message from the epidemiology in the literature, there are more risk of traumatic anterior shoulder instability in athletic population. There, there is more risk of recurrence, particularly in young, in youth population particularly when we talk about contact and collision uh, injury. If you look at the different beside that, and you have to talk about, uh, to take in consideration the anatomy, if you look at the different factor of uh, shoulder stability, you know that there are, we, we talk about the joint surface with this uh, ball and socket uh, joint uh, model, the capsulolabral structure, which are important, of course, and without uh, for forgetting the muscle concavity compression effect and even the negative intraarticular pressure. But uh, in general, the shoulder instability is the, when we want to evaluate the shoulder instability on anatomical, uh, with an anatomical perspective, it can be either soft tissue injuries or bone injuries. And you know, everyone knows that it's very important to uh, detect uh, this uh, kind of lesion. First of all, the soft tissue injury was, can be very variable and the, it's not only bulk out, as you see in the center of this slide, it can be a agile lesion, it can be an alpsa lesion, it can be a capsular injury, but the bone injuries are uh, uh, making the patient more prone to uh, have a recurrence. We know that it can be a lesion of the anterior rim of the, of the glen, of the glenoid, either a bony bulk out in acute case or with progressive erosion. And of course, this uh, heel sax lesion, this compression fracture, during the dislocation, the first dislocation, or the recurrence. If you look at the bone lesions, it's impressive how it is important. And we probably, we underestimate this uh, in the past. They are frequent and they increase with the recurrence. So this is very important, frequent and increase with the recurrence. The prevalence of a hill sax lesion, for example, is reported to be 65% to 67% after the first episode of dislocation in the literature. But when we go, when we talk about uh, recurrent dislocation, it can be 84 to 93 percent. This is one of the risk factors for recurrence beside the young age, the contact sport, definitely, the constitutional hyperlexity and the bone deficiency, the bone deficiency. So all these kind of things are risk factor for recurrence. So there is a sort of a vicious circle. More you have recurrence, more you have bone lesion. So you know, we know already that there is more risk of recurrence in athletic population after the first episode of dislocation. But then we know that if there is more recurrence, there is more bone lesion, and bone lesion is one of the risk factors of recurrence. So it's a, it's a sort of a vicious circle, and it's important to take uh, this uh, uh, thing in, uh, in consideration to, to make the, the, the treatment and to make the decision. So bone lesions must be treated, particularly in sport uh, population. There is a consensus to say that the treatment of only soft tissue lesion in case of bone lesion leads to poor result. Now I think everyone agree with that. Uh, everyone know this uh, uh, famous uh, uh, the paper in 2000 from Burkhardt and Debert showing the difference between 4% and 67% in the bone cart repair with, without or with bone defect. Can you imagine? So, you know, 67 percent of uh, recurrence if there is a bone defect. So definitely this is the surgery that you should not do. We don't do a surgery with a failure of 67 percent. So this paper and other paper after that have shown clearly that bone lesion must be treated. So message from bone lesion, they are frequent, probably more frequent than we think in anterior shoulder instability. The paper from uh, Edouard and Vash show an overall uh, percentage of 95 percent. They increase in chronic shoulder instability. So more you have recurrence, more you increase the bone lesion. And as they represent a risk factor for recurrence, it's a vicious circle. So the conclusion for the epidemiology and risk of recurrence uh, chapter, I would say, definitely there are more risk of traumatic anterior shoulder dislocation and instability in athlete. There is more risk of recurrence after an episode in athletic population particularly if we talk about the oath and if it is collision and contact. And beside that, the bone lesions are frequent and increase with recurrence. So it's important, I believe, to take all these kind of things in consideration to have a sort of a, 
full picture of what happened in the athletic population. Now, the second question is, uh, does it mean, based on the knowledge of this epidemiology and the risk of recurrence, that we have to treat the first shoulder dislocation, particularly in athletes? If you look at the natural history after a first time dislocation, the incidence of recurrent instability ranges from 14% to 100%. So it's very variable, depending on the, 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 the theory and the, and the papers, but there is something which is quite common to all these papers. More the patient is young, more he will have risk of shoulder recurrent, recurrent dislocation. After the first episode, you see that it can, beat from, uh, it can go from 72% to 100%. But recurrence doesn't mean always surgery. This study of Evelius in 2009 showed that in the, among the 72% of recurrence in the, 12, in the range, uh, the group of 12 to 22 years old, 38% require surgery, 12% continue to have symptoms of instability, and 20% became stable 15, 25 years after the initial injury. So we need to have a global picture and to know this kind of thing. Uh, in order to uh, avoid to uh, operate all the, these people, because there is a sort of uh, it's a, it's a sort of uh, hot topic, you know, uh, people push to go to operate the first time dislocation. But and this series are not about athletes. So now the question is, what about the athletes? What are the factors which influence the recurrence in the series? The, the factors linked to the patient and anatomical lesions. Patient age. We, we talked already that a young age is a factor of recurrence. Sex, psychological profile, morphotype, constitution, laxity, this is very important, like for a recurrence, and sports, particularly contact, no contact, collision, overhead. And the anatomical lesion at the time of the first episode, again, if there is bone lesion, there is a higher risk of recurrence. Does surgery change the natural history? Because now, if we know that there is a higher rate of recurrence after the first episode in young population, we must know if the surgery changed something. Yes, doesn't give 0%. But if we see that uh, this uh, systematic review, very interesting, we go from 53% global uh, percentage of recurrence after the first episode, non-operated, non to 8% when the patient have simple labrum repair. And you know that some people even propose now Latarge after the first episode. I don't know if it is a, a good idea, but this is something that we could discuss. So yes, the surgery changed the thing. So you can tell the patient if we do labral repair after your first episode of dislocation, you will have roughly 8% of risk instead of 53% or even more if you are a young patient less than 20 years old. So for the surgical decision, uh, it's important to know exactly uh, uh, all the criteria because uh, uh, some people will be operated unnecessary if you operate everyone. So we need to put in the to make the decision, the age of sport, the time, you know, it's important. For example, sometimes I decide to do the surgery or I decide to not do the surgery when I discuss with the patient because based on the first episode of dislocation happening during the season, if it is in the middle of the season or if it is at the end of the season and it can be early versus late, post-season, school term, all these kind of things are important to make the decision because you know that during three, four months, you will not be able to do uh, to play sport. And the type of lesion, of course, it means, I believe now, you cannot operate a patient for shoulder instability, first episode on, or recurrence, if you don't have an accurate imaging assessment. So I will not go to the detail because it's not the topic today, but you can do many things. It depends, you can do a, a MRI, arch MRI, arch CT scan, which are more, more accurate, but it depends if you can do that. We'll go a, a little bit fast in the, in the image, you know, that the bone calf lesion is a typical one. There are different type, type of one, but don't forget to look at the Eagle lesion because it's probably one of the factor of uh, uh, failure uh, if it is not uh, recognized with the typical G sign that you can see on the MRI, this kind of uh, image when you do arthroscopy. It can be a capsular lesion. So even if you don't have a bone calf lesion, you can have a a gaggle lesion or a lesion of the capsula, the capsule, which is a higher risk of recurrence. It can be a gland lesion, particularly in contact sport with this kind of a big image. And of course, in this case, you have to do the surgery early and not to wait the osteoarthritic uh, modification. And on the humerus side, this is the so-called Hill-Sachs lesion with the engagement and non-engagement. And now 
everyone is talking about on-track or off-track. This is a controversial topic uh, we can discuss in the, of the later on the effect and the importance of this on-track and uh, off-track of these different uh, insects, regions, which are clearly a risk factor, uh, particularly when they are used uh, like this one. Unfortunately, it's not all the case. On the glenoid side, it's a bony banca because we talk about the first time uh, uh, dislocation, and this is something that you have to uh, judge based on the percentage of, of, of the surface of the glenoid uh, surface. So to, to summarize the message about the first time shoulder dislocation, what to do? There is honestly um, no strong evidence for surgery after first time shoulder dislocation because you cannot operate all of them because otherwise you will operate uh, unnecessary. Uh, for unnecessary reason, but on the other side, the surgery has clearly advantage in some selected case, particularly athletes. So consider the surgery if young age, sport activity, particularly collision or contact, good time in the season in terms of sport and study, and uh, selected lesion. And so it means it's a case by case. And I believe in my practice, I always inform and discuss with the patient. I give the percentage of literature to say, okay, this is the risk that you have if you are operate, non-operated. If you are operated, this is the risk of a recurrence, and then decide uh, if you want to take the risk or not. And then, if you, if you manage in kind of, in this case, I think uh, if you discuss with the patient, at least you make the correct decision for himself or herself. Now, the third topic is about the third question is about the management of the chronic shoulder instability. Is it different in athlete than in a normal non-athlete? What said the literature? The factors associated with recurrence after arthroscopic banca are multiple episodes, younger age, non-compliance with post-operative mobilization, involvement in competitive or contact sport, this is clear, and uh, of course, failure to address significant glenoid and humeral head boundaries. So we, we, we find the, the, at the end the same, the same factor, you know, with the, the main factor, which are the age, the contact sport and the sport in general, and the uh, bone uh, loss and uh, involvement. So in this, uh, in the literature, usually it's classical to say the effect wider, or at least a few years ago, than 20% of the glenoid length predisposed to recurrent despite uh, the bancard repair. And uh, we should not accept for uh, bancard more than 20 or 25%, or for the insect 60% of the circumference. Actually, the things are changing in a particular in athlete. I don't know, but uh, I'm certainly not accept 20% to go for a or to go for a, a, a remplissage because you have to be much more cautious any bone lesion in athlete uh, population. And this is my, my experience. I think I learned that uh, you cannot accept even 10% because the risk is higher in athletic population. And same thing uh, concerning the engagement of track and on track because uh, particularly I don't know exactly what is on track of on track because at least uh, this uh, kind of uh, lesion was one time uh, of track because it happened at least one time to make this uh, in sex lesion. So be careful in athletic population, uh, the, the level uh, of acceptance of uh, bone lesion for a simple bancard should be very, very low, probably uh, lower than in uh, non-athlete uh, population, particularly because now we have this uh, Remplissage technique, which gives a good result. So the, the, the technique was uh, uh, described by Gene Wolf in 2004. You know that it's, uh, the term is a French term, he used a French term, which means filling. <clears throat> the concept is to make the heat sac lesion extra thicker. And probably there is a tenodesis effect from the infrasminatus. These are the different images, and it's a simple technique uh, which works because if you look at the result, the literature show better results in terms of recurrence when the remplissage is performed in association with the bancard procedure than when only isolated bancard repair is carried out. So this is something new in, well, not new, a few years, 10 years now in my uh, practice and the uh, remplissage has a clear uh, role and position in the different uh, therapeutic options that you can propose to, uh, to uh, the patient. Then of course the latage, uh, Keep the latage for the for the end because it is the, this uh, famous more and more popular uh, technique with a triple locking effect uh, uh, described by uh, Pat and Vach with the sling effect, which should be uh, apparently the more important the bone effect and the bancard effect. You can see the, those of you this capsular repair effect, bancard effect, bone effect, and sling effect. 
And I like to show this uh, case of one of my patients Bef before the capsular uh, uh, structure, you know, you see the sling effect with the coracobrachial, the conjoint tendon, which uh, tight the inferior part of the subscapularis because you pass through the subscapularis and probably it ex explain the, the good result of this surgery, which is the, uh, actually more a plasty because you do a bone cut, of course, you have the bone effect, but you could create a plasty to uh, probably compensate the, the weakness of the capsular stretch or uh, this kind of thing. Uh, in the uh, uh, high level uh, athlete particularly. The results are good. We know that the, the, goes, the recurrence goes from 0% to 8%, but in general, in the, with experimented surgeon, we go with uh, 3, 4, or 1, 2%, 6%, it depends on the section of the patient. And when we compare Latage with uh, Bancart, there is definitely uh, a difference between the two surgery, particularly when it's uh, there is bone uh, involvement, but even when there is a very slight bone involvement, the results are better with the latargen and bancal. And some people, I don't know if it is a good idea, but this is something that we can discuss. Some people do latargen systematically when they have collision and contact sport. And I would say that I'm, uh, I'm part of this, uh, of this surgeon who uh, uh, think that the latargen is more reliable uh, in terms of shoulder stability, particularly for uh, athletes than bancal. So to summarize and conclusion, now I would I like to show this uh, slide, which take in consideration the ISIS uh, score, but uh, I didn't put the ISIS score because um, it's, uh, you have different other factors that should uh, be taken in consideration. There are three, for me, three type of uh, surgery in general, in 90%, 95% of the case, the bancart, simple bancart repair, the bancart plus remplissage when there is a heel sacs, and the latargen when there is a glenoid bone loss, more or less high heel sacs. And I must admit that the, there is a sort of, sometimes it's difficult to make the decision between the banca trompices and, and the latargen, but to go to, towards the latargen, definitely the contact sport activity and particularly the hyperlexity when the hyperlexity is combined with this contact sport, uh, push me to do a more latargen for this kind of people. And, and we can say probably, in conclusion, that the right part of the screen represents uh, the surgery that uh, I'm, perf I'm performing my, with my experience, maybe I'm wrong, in the contact and collision athlete uh, to give them the best chance to uh, have a shoulder, a stable shoulder uh, after the, the, the surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Landru, for an excellent overview of uh, the anterior instability, which is a common uh, shoulder injury in the uh, athletes. Uh, so we have some questions from the uh, uh, audience. And uh, what is your standard rehab protocol after a stand standard arthroscopic bank card repair? After a simple... Uh, yeah, do you believe in accelerated rehabilitation protocol in athletes uh, for quick return, or uh, how do you uh, kind of? Uh, so, uh, we talk about athletic population, of course, because this is the topic. When there is a simple bank out, when it's a simple bank out, which is not the most frequent case, because in athletic population, it's not frequent to have uh, this kind of uh, surgery, meaning there is no bone loss, or absolutely, approximately no bone loss. Uh, I'm uh, quite uh, prudent. I don't want to go too fast because the risk is to uh, stretch the capsule and the, to put in danger the bank heart repair. During one month, uh, put a sling and the patient can go to zero degree of external rotation one and uh, 60 degree of abduction only during the four first weeks. Then after the four weeks, I let the patient progress as it, as it comes and I don't uh, allow the patient to go back to play before four months. It's interesting because there is no question about the latarge for that. The latarge, if you compare, whatever the patient athlete or not, have no restriction, zero restriction, because you do the capsular repair in, as uh, uh, advised by uh, our monitor, uh, uh, Gilles Valch, uh, to uh, repair the, the capsule in full external rotation. As you have a bone to bone fixation and the capsule which is repaired in full external rotation, for me, there is absolutely no restriction in for la target, and I encourage the people to go in external rotation and uh, flexion and abduction 
uh, as per pain tolerated. Okay. And, and uh, see, in your evaluation of the patients, uh, uh, do all of them get a CT scan and the MRI to assess the bone lesion and the soft tissue lesion, or you just do either one of them? And what is your protocol of uh, evaluating these patients radiologically? Uh, it's a good question because when I was uh, my previous activity, I could ask MRI and CT scan easily. And uh, in France, we were used to do arthro CT scan or arthro MRI. Uh, here in Dubai now, this is a system which works with the insurance. And to be honest, uh, to have MRI and CT scan, it's uh, sometimes uh, you have to struggle. So my, my uh, systematic assessment before uh, imaging, as we have good MRI, it's uh, X-ray with a three rotation uh, classical and uh, MRI. I don't do arthro MRI. I do arthro MRI in, ca in case of revision. Otherwise, I use the MRI and I do, I calculate the bone lesion on the MRI, even if it's true that it's less accurate than uh, with the PCT scan. Okay, just the MRI, good MRI will suffice. Okay, because we, we also face the same dilemma in our uh, set of practice. Mm -hmm. So I think this gives a good advice for all of us. And there are a lot of questions, but just, just one question because we're running short of time. Uh, will there be a loss of external rotation? especially in overhead athletes, if you perform a rimple search? Excellent question, because this is what we, we were a bit afraid at the beginning, myself, when I started to do this kind of thing, uh, because the, as you do a tenodesis effect and the capsular uh, tightening, actually, because you put the, the capsule on the, on the humor head, we were a bit afraid about that. There is no obvious significant loss of external rotation in the overhead athletes because but it's difficult to judge because if you look at the series of uh, isolated bank out there is always there are always uh, some uh, some percentage of loss of overhead of, of external rotation which are from uh, five percent to ten percent in the good series and in remplissage we have approximately the same percentage so i don't know if this loss of external rotation is due to the bank out to the remplissage or to both of them, but currently there is no evidence for that. In my experience, I've done the remplissage for more than 10 years now. Uh, I don't see uh, any uh, significant uh, restriction in uh, external rotation for this patient because the recovery, uh, probably the stretch at the end, their, uh, their uh, infraspinatus and their capsule. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Landru. So we'll go on to the next um, lecture uh, that is on ankle arthroscopy by uh, me and I, okay, mm -hmm. I can see my, uh... perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just give an overview of ankle arthroscopy in um, athletes. Uh, I know now it's uh, various techniques like anterior, posterior, and tendinoscopy. And uh, this, uh, I'm from the Sinamchal University, where you have the state-of-the-art uh, sports science center on this part of the world. And is uh, uh, kind of recognized by ISACOS for um, uh, sports medicine teaching facility. And recently we got uh, awarded uh, AFC, the Asian Football Confederation, first center of excellence in India. So incidence of ankle injury uh, is uh, common with uh, sports, especially when there is a lot of running and jumping like a football, volleyball, and the basketball of uh, the football participants are uh, highest in the world. And ankle injuries are extremely common. Uh, 13 and 36 uh, percent were anywhere the, the quote in the literature. The factors, as I mentioned, repeated kicking, constant changing of directions, and frequent acceleration and deceleration that leads to uh, ankle injury. And ankle arthroscopy is a less invasive and a rapid recovery and the magnification of the pathological lesions, better visualization, the versatile diagnostic and therapeutic tool. No? So you can uh, see the entire uh, ankle joint and the help in diagnosis. And uh, we were using the skeletal traction method uh, where you have to put the stainment pin across the calcaneum and do that. But uh, there are a lot of complications. So we follow the AMC method, which is popularized by uh, Nick Van Dyke, uh, where there is the dorsiflexion that creates a space just in front of the uh, tibiotella joint that is sufficient for you to 
do the very good uh, arthroscopic procedure. Uh, two standard portals, uh, anteromedial portal and anterolateral portal. Other portals are rarely required for the anterior uh, ankle arthroscopy. And this is the uh, uh, procedure just doing the uh, ankle arthroscopy, anterior one. We just use the uh, strap on the surgeon that gives a traction. So it's called a soft tissue traction. Then using a standard knee arthroscopy instrument, don't have a special equipment, and you dorsiflexion in the body, then you can do a very good um, uh, arthroscopic uh, of the uh, ankle joint. So uh, the scope in the middle portal and the probe is the anterolateral portal. You can go by step by step, entire ankle joint, starting with the medial gutter, and then you can go into the talus uh, here under the tibia, just saw there. And the cutter, you can look for the uh, synovium, the loose body, and the distal tibia fibular uh, joint. You know, just with the soft twitch traction, you can clearly visualize the entire uh, uh, ankle joint. And the, one of the most common uh, pathology is uh, OCD. Osteochondral defect incidence is about 50 to 70 persons, and you can see anterolateral dome. There is a OCD. Usually, the clinically have a pain, clicking, and locking, and the small lesion. You can just do bone marrow stimulation, and you clear same as the knee. You know, you have a clear margin, and then you can use a micro fracture, the bone marrow stimulation, and this is shown the return to sports. Uh, as high as uh, 65 to 90 percent, and as early as uh, four months, they can return to these sports. Right? Then, anterior ankle impingement, otherwise called um, the footballer's ankle, the osteophytes in the uh, uh, anterior uh, part of the ankle joint. Uh, 60 percent of osteophytes, only 15 percent are symptomatic. Arthroscopic is a gold standard. You go in and just shave of the osteophyte and the very good uh, results. The ATFL injury is about 20 to 40 percent acute uh, sprains and the chronic uh, going down of chronic ankle instability. The symptoms are pain, limping, intermittent locking, and giving way. The anatomic arthroscopic brostrum gold repair uh, gives 90 percent excellent results. Advantages can be done arthroscopically. This one is because of the, depends on the innate uh, uh, tissue quality. You know, here we're using our uh, uh, knowledge or uh, instruments of what we normally use in shoulder arthroscopy. You place the anchor first on the uh, wound, then you take uh, the suture passes and inserting the second anchor and taking the bite on the uh, the ligament. And you can see how open it's uh, uh, initially. At the end of the procedure, when you tie it, the entire space is um, closed. Right? So that's the advantage. You can do the simple uh, technique. Then the posterior ankle arthroscopy, you have two portals, posterior lateral portal and the posterior medial portal. And um, here, again, using the uh, soft tissue traction. And this is a technique popularized by Nick Van Dyck. And you make a portal close to the lateral uh, malleolus on the straight line, just on the next to the Achilles tendon, and then middle portal using the probe on the opposite section, and using again the same knee arthroscopy instruments and point toward the first toe web, inserting the, your uh, scope. Then with the other portal, you bring in with your uh, probe or artery, then you can shave off the fat pad, then you can enter into the posterior ankle joint, you can see the entire uh, joint very clearly. And various lesions can be uh, treated. The most common indication is posterior ankle impingement, the Achilles tendon, retrocalcular bursitis, and peroneal tendon recurrent dislocation. So other important uh, pathology, group of uh, pathologies, the posterior impingement syndrome, it's a collection of pathologies characterized by posterior ankle joint pain, usually due to mechanical and inflammatory conflict, aggravated by the plantar flexions, repetitive load frequently leading to restriction of uh, movement, more common in uh, dancers and uh, footballers. And the causes are could be osseous lesion or soft tissues. 80% is osseous, like osteogonum, straight up process, shepherd's fractures, or soft tissues more like tetanus and nodules and uh, 
so forth. And these are the example, the house trigonum and like this, and straight up procedures. This all can be effectively treated uh, arthroscopically. This is again the example of uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy. There you can see already the, the uh, <coughs> peroneus longus. And this is the straight up procedure. And after removing your fat pad around it, you can clearly demark it. And with the osteotone, you can remove the um, uh, style of the side of process. And with limited morbidity, you can have the good outcome for these athletes. The other important pathology is uh, Haglund uh, lesion or retrocactal bursitis. Uh, clinically, it's a chronic problem, causes severe heel pain, can be effectively managed by arthroscopy, avoids wound complication and, and uh, Achilles tendon taking uh, This is a pathology which can be uh, saved off. And uh, you to know the level, how much resect you put uh, to a K wire uh, radioscopically. As you can see here, this is a pre op. Then you go into the posterior ankle arthroscopy, identify the agglion lesion, uh, excision of the retrocalcular bursa, and the exposure of the calcaneus. Then there is a haglin lesion which needs to be removed. And we under the uh, CM, you introduce the, the two wires, and all the structures above that wire should be removed. Okay, you use your arthroscopic bird and slowly take off all the uh, process uh, protuberant above that uh, wire. And coming near the Achilles tendon, uh, you, you use your scoop, and thereby you are uh, avoiding injury to the um, tender Achilles. So this is a big advantage. Otherwise, in open procedure, you have to take down the Achilles tendon, then remove the, uh, this uh, abdominal lesion. So that is the advantage of uh, arthroscopic procedure. That's the pre-op and there's a post-op after the resection. Right. So this is a pre-op and there's a post-op. So the simple technique, you can do that. The other one is the uh, peroneal tendon subluxation, quite common, and using the uh, uh, wrist arthroscope, we can go into these uh, uh, tunnels, uh, peroneus brevis and longus, and then also it's possible to uh, deepen the uh, um, sulcus groove so that the tendon doesn't come, and also you can repair this uh, fascia so that the tendon doesn't dislocate. In conclusion, arthroscopy is a valuable diagnostic and therapeutic tool in ankle injuries. Better understanding of anatomy and pathology is a paramount of successful outcome. Very minimally invasive, rapid recovery, and faster return to play are the major advantage. And there's, there's a steep learning curve, but the biggest advantage to the athletes are uh, they can go back to our uh, sports much earlier. And thank you for your uh, attention. So, I know Dr. Chan, you're doing a lot of uh, ankle arthroscopy and uh, your comments or uh, your uh, uh, inputs on any, any comments on this topic, please. Yeah, very impressed that uh, you've done a very good job. <laughs> a very impressive technique. Um, my my, my, uh, uh, arthroscopic uh, surgery around the ankle and foot is not as extensive as yours at the moment. But yeah, I do some of the anterior impingement, posterior impingements. Um, the, uh, the, it's interesting that you, your, you, you, what's your results for the anterior ankle instability? I mean, the uh, ATFL reconstruction, have you done any of that? Yeah, I did a few, but as you can, uh, good question, as you correctly pointed out, uh, not all of them are amenable for arthroscopic repair. It all depends on the native, uh, how much of the remnant uh, is there. And then you can do it going early. More chronic, probably you have to go for a traditional reconstruction. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, we just, uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, the more questions, but only we are uh, over the time. So uh, some question comes, we'll forward it to you. And thank you all for um, uh, sharing valuable time and the difficult time to come and participate in this uh, webinar. Hope to uh, see you in person and uh, soon. Thank sure. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Uh,
Thank you, Jagraj, and also. Well Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Nice meeting you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willem. Thank you, Dr. Philip. Bye, Philip. See you. 10. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you in Cape Town. Okay, we should. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Bye bye. 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 Philip. Bye. I will go to YouTube to see the presentation of uh, the, that I missed. See you guys.